Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Secret Sauce of Selling podcast, the ultimate guide and sales gym to unlocking secrets of successful selling. I'm your host, James Abraham, and I'm excited to be here with you today to sh- and share insights, tactics, and strategies to help you take your sales performance and sales leadership game to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This week, we've got Michael Norton, um, a brother, a colleague, a mentor, um, a rock star. I've uh, known Michael for many, many, many years and uh, so excited to have him on our show today. Um, and Michael is the Executive Vice President of Enterprise at Sandler. Welcome to the show, Mike. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, James. It's really good to see you. <laughs> and today we're talking about sales leadership. And um, tell us a little bit about the topic and uh, what, what, you know, let's unpack that. Why are we talking about that today, beginning of Q, Q2 2023? Yeah, I think you know when when organizations are looking to uh, transform their sales teams or get better results, they're all trying to improve, right? They're either trying to increase something, improve something, expand something, or reduce something. And when you, you think about leadership and the direction they give their teams, hey, look, we need we need better results, or we need to you know maintain our market share and not you know and not have the competition come in. So if they're going to be if if they're going to direct their team to invest or explore investing in sales training or performance training, sales management training, and then back out. That's a huge problem. Where I've seen this, and you know, James, I've been doing this for 25 years. When when I see successful rollouts, it's when the CEO, the COO, the entire C-suite gets behind this initiative. Even some of the best companies that we've worked with, they've gone through the training themselves, not just putting it on their sales managers or their salespeople. So that's one of the areas I'm passionate about because, look, it, they invest a lot of money. You think about organizations with 20, 30, 50, 100, a couple hundred, a thousand sellers, they're investing a lot of money. And if they don't take the time to be bought in, their people aren't going to be bought in. Yeah, that's, uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a great topic. So listeners and viewers, if you ever work for a huge company or if you work for a small company, Michael here deals with huge sales forces that really need to align. And, um, and, and so when, when looking at that, you know, that amount of people, those styles, those personalities, those behaviors, and I, you know, we, a lot of sellers out there, they, they'll know it's me, you know, small, medium, maybe small enterprise, but looking at those larger fleet, fleets, what, what's going on? I mean, how can you control such an initiative of aligning everyone towards a specific a specific process? What are the challenges and 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 so clearly, how involved can leadership really be? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And the larger the organization, the harder that becomes to kind of control it. And so. Yeah, I, I'm suggesting that leadership get involved to the point where, you know, we, you and I, we know Sandler because we've been doing Sandler forever, right? We know the importance of an upfront contract. We know the importance of pain and asking for pain and how to get there. We know the importance of asking questions the right way. I'm not saying that, that the a CEO or COO or uh, the chief revenue officer of a large organization needs to be down at the whole level of understanding completely the uh, selling system, but they should be picking up on the key and most important elements so that when they are on calls or meeting a customer with a salesperson or at a team event, they can ask their salesperson or their sales manager, hey, how's your upfront contract going? How's that pain funnel? How, you know, and so at least they're supporting and reinforcing the concepts. Mm. Makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that... Um we do witness in large organizations and, and you know, even smaller ones, leadership are disconnected from what's supposed to happen. Yeah, they want everyone to, to, to implement process. Um, they want process to be king. However, they're not really aware of those little nuts and bolts that are in the system. Uh, and, um, and, and I think it's a, it's a challenge for leadership today because everyone's so overwhelmed with all, you know, so many tasks and so on. I, I talk a lot about um, leadership from a decision-making process where decision-making in the organization has become a bottleneck for growth. No one's making decisions and it all piles up onto the CRO's desk and the CEO's desk. And then they don't really have time to connect with the people within the organizations that are delegated to get things done. And it, does that make any sense? I mean, it creates that, 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 that vacuum. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. And it goes to my next point that, you know, around what you asked me about, how do you manage this? 
in a whether it's small, medium, large organization, make sure they the client really should have somebody who is a primary point of contact. Like this becomes their almost full time job. Where I see it break down is where they say, "Hey, James, you're our vice president of sales for our, you know, uh, Amia. Uh, you, I want you to be the also be the." point person for the sales training initiative we're going to be deploying and I want you to be responsible for it. Well, you already have a full-time job as a VP, right? If that was going to be your role. So I think when they try to just uh, flatten out the organization and, and make either managers or VPs responsible for the program, it usually doesn't work. Having people from sales enablement, delegating that responsibility, having somebody who knows how to build the right cohorts, how to make sure every everything is there and ready for their teams and that they're reinforcing it. Yeah. Um, so uh, from an enablement perspective, I was hoping that we could unpack the enablement part. Uh, what I think my question to you was, um, again, when it comes to leadership leveraging enablement, are there best practices these days that you notice or do you find that leadership struggle to understand how they should be delegating enablement, how they should be uh, connecting those dots, performance development, so training and development, in-house uh, 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 enablement, and then leadership, and, and just really tying that together. Because what I'm experiencing these days is that a lot of the leadership don't really know how to leverage enablement. They're they're in a little, all right, go and figure it out for me, or go and get revenue. Now they're calling it revenue operations. That's this new thing. Right, you ever yep. come up with that? Yeah, I was like, "What is that?" And everyone's trying to figure that out. So, what are the trends from your point of view when it comes to dealing with a hundred, two hundred, five hundred, a thousand sellers in an organization uh, when it comes to uh, leveraging enablement and 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 from and again from a leadership perspective? Yeah, from a leadership perspective, I'll I'll use myself as the example as you know the the EVP for Sandler here. What's happened in enablement and and the way it's changed even over the last five years, even if we go back two or three years, because technology changes so rapidly. As a leader, I, I, I can't keep up with the amount of technology and new technology. I just no. talked, we just talked with Yair a few seconds ago, and he explained a new technology. So what you saw, uh, what we've seen happen over and over again, is people just started buying technology. They're like, okay, let's throw technology at it. Let's throw this tool, this tool, this tool, this tool. Here we are at Sandler, and, and we're not that giant, right? We have 10 different enabling technologies. And how do you, as a leader, how do you understand what they're using? You need to get consumption reports. Is it proving out to be effective? Or did we buy all these tools and they're really only using two or three? Right? Yeah. So are they leaning on techs, on sales tech stacks and hoping for the best? Or is it just uh, trendy? What's What's behind it? What's driving what? Is it enablement, driving technology, hoping it will solve a problem of behaviors? I don't... Yeah, I think the problem is a few things. You buy too many technologies and you're not using them all. You don't take enablement seriously enough. It's We need to, we have so many tools and we have so much content that we're, you know, that we have to get consume to make our salespeople effective. Any organization out there that puts together and builds a really strong enablement team is going to see greater results, hmm. right? Okay. I mean, I mean, again, I'm just. We came off of a meeting last week that we had our whole team together, and we looked at everything that we're doing from Rev Ops, from enablement, right? What are our tools? What are our techniques? What do we need to improve to get better? And what we came away with is a less is more approach. Tell me more we, about that. So again, let's let's zero in on the tools that we're that we're really using and let's get much better at using them, right? How our team is using a HubSpot. That's our CRM of choice. How are mm -hmm. we getting better at the cadences and the sequences that we're using there, right? Uh, Vidyard, how are we using Vidyard to send out videos and engage? How are we really using LinkedIn? We, we um, have a system that we use to really leverage and harness the power of LinkedIn. Mm. Yeah, I understand. And so let's take it back to the behavioral piece and, and from leadership and development of, of, of sales forces. And, um, and I think that's a lot of people have been telling me recently, we got to go back to the basics. We got to go back to the basics. We got to go back to the foundations of doing things. We got to go back to hands-on coaching, engagements, and very similar to 
you know, high touch selling where you want your seller to be talking and building relationships with their buyers. We also want managers being more engaged with their salespeople and leaders being more engaged with, with, with managers. From your perspective, and how do you believe the, these days, I think those younger crowds, those younger fleets, those younger sellers, how can they start to really go back to the basics when it comes to leading to success, coaching their people to success, um, optimizing their pipeline, stuff like that? Because what we're finding is we're finding a lot of micromanagement out there. We're finding a lot of people that don't really know how to manage, don't really know how to coach. Um, and are really starting to lean on to technology, hoping that the technology will just take, you know, will just solve the problem. So I think my question to you is, um, what are the best practices that sellers, lead, selling leadership, sales leadership should actually be uh, leaning towards and, and starting to uh, implement? Yeah, they should definitely not be leaning, all, putting everything on technology, hoping technology is going to fix the problem, right? The technology is great. Learn how to use the technology. Learn what it, you know, what's working and what's not. They have to be in the people business. People, we're still people, right? It's still very relational. Sales managers uh, need to do their one-on-ones. They need to learn. If they don't know how to coach, they need to ask for help and get coaching help because there's a big difference between managing, thinking you're managing, and truly coaching and mentoring somebody. There's a huge difference there. Yeah, and, and, and how in these days when looking at those larger um, uh, sales teams, hundreds sometimes, um, how, how are enablement and management leadership, how are they monitoring uh, those sellers that are excelling and can be enhanced and those sellers that are not doing so well and might need a little bit of a nudge? And those sellers will never be fixed or never be, never be great, but, you know, they might in some cases actually hold the organization back because um, you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with those larger organizations. And from your perspective, you know, how are they picking up on where they need to be, fo- where, where they need to be? Uh, focusing their attention. So obviously in big organizations, any size organization, numbers are always going to be important, right? So the very first thing I would always tell a sales manager, leader, is you really need to own your CRM. Whatever CRM tool you are using, you need to have it up and live in it every day. But more Mm. importantly, you need to coach and hold your salespeople accountable to using it every single day. There's no reason I should ever open up my CRM tool and see an opportunity with a close date that was two weeks ago and it's still an active opportunity. Or there's never, I should never open up my CRM tool and not see notes from the very last interaction or call. I should never open it up and not see uh, attachments that went out, right? If everything needs to be in there, if it's not, you have to get maniacal about the hygiene of your CRM. That's, that's the one way to stay connected. But the other thing is also asking your sell- sellers, where are where do they feel they need the help? Too often they just, we tell them, you know, we get that, well, well, here's what I did when I was a salesperson, or here's how I got really good. Let me tell you what you need to do. And what they need to do is fall back, at, like we teach at Sandler, ask questions. Just like they're, they're your client. Your salesperson is your client. You have to take care of them. You're managing up, you're managing down, you're managing sideways to make sure your seller has everything that they need be successful. And the way you ask is ask them what they need. And you can make it even the three levels of pain, James, right? What's the surface? What's going on? How's that impacting your business and your numbers? But more importantly, James, how's that impacting you and your personal life and your home life? Get to what they need and then help coach them to it or get somebody who can give them that coaching. I love it. I love it. I'm just takeaways here. I'm taking some notes. CRM hygiene will lead to pipeline with funnel hygiene because everyone wants funnel hygiene, but where you get a, where do you get a smelly, fluffy, stinky funnel from yeah. not having a good, clean and hygienic CRM. And I, and I think that is, that is spot on for me. That's my takeaway from this conversation. And yeah, there's I, another, there's another thing you said, which is manage sideways. I, I know that was a figure of speech, but I mean, that is everyone's managing from top down or from bottom up, but no one is in most cases, not everybody, some are, but it does take an effort to say, wait a second, let's look at it from the side for a moment. Let's just see what the angles show us. Let's, um, let's look from a different facet. Exactly. Because you know, you're, you could be a, a, a regional sales manager and you might have an equivalent over an enablement who's got the same title. You may have an equivalent over in learning development or in HR or in marketing. 
and you know, you're managing all those people as well, just the relationship to make sure that you're getting all the support that you need for your sellers. And not only that, here's the other one, James, on that managing sideways, peer to peer. You could be one of eight regional sales managers. Are you talking to each other about best practices on a regular basis? Are you holding meetings just for yourselves to talk about what your best sellers are doing and how do you transfer that knowledge to your seller? Yeah, I love it. Um, I'm curious. So you work with large organizations and if I were to ask you, you know, what are, what are the challenges that you find they're having these days? Let's pretend that you'd have a large organization reach out to you. They got a few hundred, maybe even a few thousand sellers the challenges that they share these days with with you guys when when approaching and, and saying you know we might need some help let's have a conversation what does your 30 yep. second commercial sound like Am I, oh yeah i'll give you my 30 second commercial hey, on that. hey james typically when i'm working with clients of the, that size they they invite us in because they're trying to get better at something as i said earlier they're either trying to improve something increase something expand something or reduce something when they're trying to increase something maybe it's revenue net new logo acquisition increase average deal size, right? Or average sale price. If they're trying to improve something, maybe it's margin or sales behaviors, right? Retention, renewals, improve those. If they're trying to expand, they're trying to get better, going higher, wider, deeper, upselling and cross-selling. And if they're trying to reduce something, everybody's focused on reducing sales cycle time, reducing uh, turnover, you know, the cost of turnover for, for sellers and reducing um, customer retention or customer um, attrition. I don't know enough about your organization, James, if any of those things are important to you, but I'd love to have a conversation and learn more. And so larger enterprises, so many moving parts these days, um, and they haven't figured out to fix one thing, and they're looking at another angle over there. So I'm just curious, um, when you when you go into that, that size of an organization, how do you approach this stuff? Yeah, so um, if... if I have a call just like this, if it's a technology call or a virtual call, I'll actually just pull up one slide that has those specific KPIs. And I do it fairly early in the conversation. And I encourage our sellers to do it fairly in the conversation as well. You know, we, we do the upfront contract, we launch into questioning, and we get to that point and say, you know, if I was going to show you that slide, James, and you can look at, at, you know, just those 14 that are sitting right in front of you, what are the most important to you? And they'll literally, every time, give me three to five to seven. And then the rest of the conversation is, tell me more about that. Why is that a problem? Why are you, why are you, you know, it's either a gap or a goal, right? They're either trying to fix something that's broken or they have a, a new goal that they're trying to achieve, right? And the biggest mistake um, people make about our business, James, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but people seem to think that they own, the only time uh, companies contact us or want to work with us is because they're broken. And that's not the truth. The truth is companies who come to us are doing really well. They just want to raise the bar and go even higher and stronger. They don't want the competition catching up, right? So, yeah, I agree one hundred percent. I think there's a there's a hint of arrogance out there when they're like, "Oh, but people do training when things are bad." Well, sometimes, sometimes, but the real winners, they give me, my phone rings when they're like, "We want to be way. We know we got it in us, and we just want to be way better." And they're willing to willing and able to put their ego aside. They're willing and able to take a step outside of their comfort zone. They're willing and able to take a good look in the mirror um, to find out where they should be better and why. And, and 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 the way you describe your your discovery discussion is 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 gold because sellers today, I think in general, um, if they pull up a deck, it's more because they want to talk about themselves and their products and not about the challenges and what's important to the buyers. That's that's one hundred percent right. As a matter of fact, I, that slide I show is sometimes the only slide I ever show, and everything else becomes a discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. the way it should be. It should. I mean, that's the way it should be. Amazing. Story. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Michael, what is your secret sauce for selling? You know, uh, James, I'm, I'm. It's going to sound like a you know Sandler commercial, but it's it's the absolute truth. And it's something I learned about Sandler twenty years ago, and it still is important today. And that's behavior, attitude, and technique, the success triangle. You have to live all three parts of the triangle. And when we get into the upper, have the opportunity to talk to chief revenue officers, C-suite folks about it, and we show that slide, and we talk about how important it is that sellers must do the behaviors, even if they don't feel like it, right? You, know, yeah. you have to do the behaviors, and your head has to be in the game, because we could all talk ourselves out of making a phone call or going visiting a prospect. 
and we need the skills because once we get in front of them, we need to know what to do. But here's the thing. Here's my big secret sauce. The way I think about that triangle is if you do all three, you're building the person all the way around. You're not just focused because too many people just want to focus on skill, 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 skill. When you focus on their behavior and their attitude, their head and their heart and their skill, and you combine it all together, you're going to build a better person. And if you build better people, those people in turn are going to build you a better business. I love it. Awesome. Awesome. Michael, thank you so much. Um, before we finish, uh, why don't you give us an idea of anything interesting? You're, I know you're a you, you love reading, and uh, I can I can see I can see a lot of books on the shelf over there. Um, why don't you share anything uh, that you're reading recently that uh, that you would highly recommend to listeners um, or viewers? I'm going to give this guy a plug right here, yeah. Dr. Benjamin Hardy. This was awesome. He did a talk at our conference. I got the book. The book is awesome. I went back and I watched the whole video again. Uh, I watched his stuff on YouTube. It talks about how do you be your better self now, your future self now. We felt it was so important that the, the what came out of that book – when we took our team off site last week, we actually went through an exercise where we 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 uh, created um, a worksheet around this and completed it and talked about it, socialized it with each other, and how we're going to hold each other accountable to being our future self. Yeah, Ben Hardy's awesome. I high, highly recommend getting the book, uh, Being Your Future Self. And I think as sellers, during these times of uncertainty, of VUCA, I talk a lot about VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity. Now, it's a VUCA world. So we're in a VUCA world again. We we're in a VUCA world a couple of years ago. We we're in a VUCA world. We were a VUCA world a few months ago with this whole economic uh, turnaround thing, which in my opinion is an, is an opportunity, but that's, you know, it might be one of the few. Um, but also with all this AI stuff that's, pro you know, that's popping up and everyone's like, oh my God, in like three months, everything's changed. Everything's changed. The environment's changed. And, and I think as sellers, we really need to focus on who do we want to be in the future? If we don't think that way, if we don't live that way now, we will never become successful and we'll always stay behind the curve. And had a, a, I did a podcast with, uh, with Mike on this one. I was actually the other way around with Mike Montague as, um, as being uh, at the interview and I was a host. And we talked about that on how to stay. So um, I really appreciate that recommendation of the book. Uh, and just one more thing. Let's just uh, get this out of the way and just mention our sponsors for this podcast. Novacy. Um, Novacy unlocks behavioral insights from virtual meetings help you close more business, but also understand what's really happening on your calls, check out novacy.io. Um, and so back to you, Mike, um, what is your vision for 2023, 2024? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tie that to AI and AI is going to change everything and it's happening faster and faster as we're, as we're seeing, but here's the thing, because I've heard, I've heard this since, you know, the internet came around. The internet is going to do away with the need for salespeople. Technology is going to do away with the need for salespeople. Now what we're hearing is, you know, some people are saying, and it's usually more mature sellers, uh, and they'll say, hey, AI is going to, you know, disrupt this and we're going to be out of a job. And no, that's not true. AI-empowered sellers are going to uh, do away with non-AI-empowered sellers. Hmm. Right. We have to lean into the technology. We have to embrace what it is. There's still there's still going to be a need for our expertise in what we do and whatever your product and whoever's listening to this, whatever your products and services are, there's always going to be a need for you. But your sellers have to have that, that AI capability and the technology behind them. I love it. Yeah, I ain't going away, and human beings are not going away. We're going to learn how need, need to learn how to work to get, live together. Exactly. I love it. Awesome. Michael, thank you so much. Um, listeners, if you are viewers, um, thanks for tuning in. You can reach out to Michael. Michael, how can people find you? Uh, link, you can, best way is LinkedIn. Just go to LinkedIn, Michael Norton Sandler, uh, and, and you'll find me. If you're connected to James, I'm connected to him. You'll see me in his, in his connections. Yep. And Michael is a master of, imagine this, listeners, and this training and developing hundreds and thousands of people in organizations. And I think that is an awesome, awesome thing to do. So uh, congratulations on your success, Michael. And uh, to the listeners uh, and viewers, tune in next time. Subscribe to the Secret Sauce of Selling podcast. And uh, whatever you do, make sure you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. Good selling, no guts, no gain, and have a lot of fun while you're doing it.